name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. For Nicodemus in today's gospel, he gets uh, a bad reputation in the history of the interpretation of the Bible. Uh, he's often so sort of a uh, whipping boy for people's various uh, agendas, uh, particularly anti-Semitism historically. Uh, let's just review who he is briefly. He appears three times in the Gospels, in the Gospel of John. Uh, this is the first appearance where he comes by night to Jesus. Uh, the second appearance is when uh, Jesus is being accused in front of the Sanhedrin, and so he argues for a fair treatment of Jesus. And then later on, after Jesus is crucified, uh, Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, not to be confused with, with uh, Joseph of, of, uh, of Nazareth, Joseph of Arimathea uh, purchases a large amount of spices and fragrances and oils, about 100 pounds, it says in the gospel, uh, to bring to prepare Jesus' body for burial, which he does with, with Joseph. So he has these three appearances in the Bible. Um, the usual interpretation of him coming at night is that he was afraid of being seen with Jesus. He was afraid of being seen going to Jesus because of the judgment that might be uh, come upon him if he was identified with the followers of Jesus. This is actually, though, another interpretation, which is that coming to someone at night, a uh, teacher at night, this was a good time, actually, to receive teaching because the day's work was done, the dishes were put away, as, as it were, and people could talk in the night by candlelight, and, and it was a good time for teaching. So maybe that wasn't such a nefarious thing. But it is true that he didn't seem to stand up and say, I'm for Jesus, in, in a way that was so strident that it would get him killed. So he appears three times, and he comes in this instance, and he asks Jesus about, you know, you are a teacher, of, you, you know, we see in you the work of God, what is this about? Jesus tells him he must be born again, and this causes this question, right? said to him, how can these things be, well, actually even before that, um, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Now this is where Nicodemus gets in trouble in the interpretive tradition, because a lot of people take him literally, and they think he meant this literally. I disagree. This is a perceptive man. We already know that he sees in Jesus wisdom and, and the works of God. And I think that he's asking that question, not literally, but poetically. He's using Jesus' own language about being born again and says, basically, how can that be? How can this be the case? How can we be born again? And this is a question that we might have. And Jesus says, you know, don't you understand? How can you be a teacher of Israel and not understand? And, and so on. But for whatever reason, it seems in the tradition as though people believe that Nicodemus has just enough to get him into the door to see Jesus, but not quite enough perception to receive faith. So the question is, does Nicodemus have faith? I think he might. After all, the question that he asks, how can these things be, is the faithful question that Mary asks early on in the Gospels when the angel visits her at the Annunciation. She says, how can these things be? She too wonders how spirit and flesh can come together. What comes to mind when you think of faith? Some people might think immediately of something like belief, as in uh, the propositions of faith, you know, believing that, that God exists or that, or that Jesus was his son. Others might talk about trust and, and the way that we trust something we can't quite see, that we have no evidence for, but nonetheless we believe to be true. Others might speak of faith as a certain steadfastness that keeps one true to their relationship with each other or with the God above. I would say that in faith we see something of the peculiar human habit to reach towards a reality beyond ourselves, toward a, toward a hope which is just beyond the horizon of our rational knowing. There is in faith that peculiar human aspiration toward a promise of something just beyond our hope. <coughs> to do that requires a certain kind of imagination. I would say it's a missional imagination even, an imagination which pauses the possibility of something a little bit better. And I'm not talking about a better life in terms of like, you know, bread and honey. I'm talking about something better existentially, something more true than what we can touch and grasp with our hands and with our eyes. In the story of Sarah and Abraham, we see just this kind of imagination at work. Because how else could they abandon what they knew and go to that which was beyond, the horizon literally in this case? To abandon their clan group, to go to a region which they had never been to before, this required extreme risk and courage. And I would say a certain kind of forgetting forgetting of the past, a forgetting of the risks at hand, and an ignoring of the contrary and risk-averse voices. In 1917, there was a, a group of Methodists who had uh, formed a community in Russia, 
And at that time, the current czar, I'm not sure which one, uh, that current czar was contemplating an invasion of a neighboring country. And so he sent spies to the Methodist congregation, these foreigners living in his land, to see what their thoughts were about this invasion. And he heard, uh, the spies heard and reported back to the czar, that the congregation was preaching pacifism. That they were preaching that, that war was wrong and this war was not justified. In a sense, the czar had them all shipped off to Siberia, arrested and moved to Siberia, where they continued to have a church, even though they were in prison and in exile, until 1947, when the communists banned all religion and dismantled all religious uh, denominational structures and, and banned the practices of, of Christianity and other faiths. Then, fast forward to 1994, when uh, the uh, religious liberty was restored to the Russian people. Now, interestingly, the, the Russian government, though, would only recognize four religions. Orthodox, that is Russian Orthodox uh, Christianity. They would recognize Buddhism, Hinduism, and Islam. They would not recognize any Protestant faiths. There was a loophole, though. They said they would recognize any other faith if it could document that it was there before 1947. So the Methodist community, which had gone underground, started to come back up to the surface. And the people in that community tried to find evidence that could prove that they were there before 1947. But the Russian government was reluctant to grant them that. So even though they found pictures of, of their life before 1947, uh, pictures of, of what it was like when they first moved to Siberia and other pieces of, of documentation from their own stories and their own archives, the Russian government wouldn't accept that evidence. They said it wasn't official government evidence. So then, uh, the archives of the KGB were opened for a time for researchers and historians. And so the, the Methodists sent historians to the KGB archives. And in the archives, they were able to find copious records of the, of the imprisonment of the, the Methodists and how they had been shipped off to Siberia and so on. And so the government had to reluctantly accept that the KGB evidence was, in fact, official government documentation, that their Christian group did exist before 1947 in Russia. And so the Methodists are one of the few Protestant groups that have official recognition in Russia. But imagine what it was like, though, for the Methodists uh, in 1920-something. I'm sorry, in, yeah, around that time, when they were sent off to Siberia. Uh, imagine when some of the older members of the community who had been part of that original group that had been exiled, imagine when they started to die off and what their children might have thought people that had been, uh, come to the faith, presumably because they believed in the promises of God. And how abandoned must they have felt when they were shipped off to Siberia and decade after decade went by and there was no redemption for them from their suffering? It took something of the imagination for those people to keep hope alive. Consider Psalm 121 that we have today. One of my favorite psalms, actually. You know, I, look, I, I lift up my eyes to the hills from where is my help to come. There's a lot of ways to interpret that, but for me, you know, if you've ever looked at a mountain range, you have some sense of that kind of existential imagination that gets awakened, that sense that you have that you're part of something much grander than yourself, much bigger than yourself. I think that for those Methodists in the 1920s, or in the 1930s, and the 1940s, they too must have looked on that barren waste of Siberia and thought something of something beyond themselves. They must have thought of their children and the hope that might be awakened when freedom would come again to Russia and religious liberty. Nicodemus, as I said, gets a bad rap. What kind of faith did he have? I'm willing to give him a bit of slack and to think that in him was the kernel of the imagination of hope. You know, in him, there was enough curiosity to go to Jesus. There was enough belief in Jesus to put himself at risk by speaking on his behalf in front of the Sanhedrin, and later to uh, come out as one of the ones who would receive Jesus' body and prepare him for burial. Think about the loving act of preparing someone for burial. I mean, I don't know if you've ever uh, seen that. I, I saw that one time uh, with some nurses that were preparing a body for burial. This was somebody in the hospital where I had served, and um, they passed away, and it was a, it was a teaching hospital. And so uh, they, the uh, nurse that was the head of the ward was going to teach some of the student nurses what to do when someone passed away. And I asked if I could stay and, and watch, and, and the, t the teacher said, of course. And so I kind of stayed in the corner. And what she did was first she t said to the student nurses, the first thing that you must do is to assure that the person is, is really passed away, she said, because doctors sometimes make mistakes. <laughs> so she said, never rely on one sign. 
always look for multiple signs. She said, take your time. And you know, very lovingly, she, she took the person's wrist and felt for a pulse. She used a stethoscope to see if their heart was still beating. She, she checked for capillary refill. You know, if you squeeze your, your fingernail and it goes white for a second, you let go, it gets red again. Uh, she, she had two or three other things that she recommended. So she, having done those, then she very carefully began to arrange the clothes that the person was wearing and, and to begin to, to drape them very carefully with, with a bed sheet and, and do other sorts of things that were, were very loving, very gentle. I was impressed by, by the character of her, of her touch, the way she touched this person. I think it must have been the same for Nicodemus and for Joseph of, of uh, Arimathea when they went to the body of Jesus. This was a very loving thing to do for him. So. When we think of Nicodemus, I think that we should not think of someone who had incomplete faith or someone who had rejected Jesus in any kind of way, but rather someone who was on the same journey that we're on. You know, I think for many of us, we can identify with Nicodemus. We can, we can see in him, in, in ourselves, that imagination which sees in Jesus the workings of God. And maybe we're not ready to take that huge risk that might put our own lives in jeopardy and to give away all our possessions and some of the other things that a radical following of Jesus seems to suggest. But... We're almost there. We're almost there. And we are ready to receive Jesus. We're, we're, we're right on that cusp. And who knows what happened after this. But I want to bid us to keep that imagination alive in our minds of that thing which is just beyond the horizon of this world. That hope that Nazareth, that uh, Nicodemus had that he couldn't even express. So now I'm going to open this up. I don't know what I'm going to do. Let's see if anyone has anything to share.